Shana Tova. I want to wish you all a Gemar Chatima Tova. Our tradition teaches us not that God's sitting up there writing in the book of life, but over these next 26 hours, you have the power to figure out what your inscription is going to be. So I hope you use your time wisely over these next, next few hours. Home is where the heart is. On Rosh Hashanah morning, I spoke in depth about our homes as a place of shalom bayit, of peace and harmony. I spoke about it as a place of the heart. I told you and spoke to you and taught you about the symbol of the mezuzah that reminds us Jews, whether we're on our way or in our homes, of the Jewish values and ideals that are supposed to frame our daily lives. I spoke to you about how our homes are a dwelling place for the Holy Divine One. Tonight on this holiest of nights, I want to speak to you about a different home, a home where the heart of the Jewish people still beats, a home where the Jewish soul is refreshed, a home of Jewish solidarity, of learning, and song that keeps the Jew in Judaism. This is the Jewish home of the synagogue. What you might not know is that synagogues developed in the late Second Temple period as a gathering and prayer place for communities that were actually too far from the ancient temple in Jerusalem. Some of you may have learned that it formed after the temple was destroyed, but in actuality, it was concurrent with the second temple. The synagogue as a place of gathering for Jews grew after the destruction of the temple in the year 70. It is our Beit Tefillah, our house of prayer, our Beit Midrash, our house of learning, and a Beit Knesset, a home of gathering as one people just like we are doing now. While the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, the Jewish people asked themselves, what would the home and the dwelling place for God become? It had been destroyed. And so the synagogue, the place where Jews gathered, became that home for the Holy One the holy divine presence. And so, on holy nights like these, we gather in this holy space to touch all that is sacred and all that is valuable in our lives. On Kol Nidra, we come here to the synagogue seeking to renew and refresh our world-weary and cynical selves. This home, our Kol Ami home, our synagogue home is a holy place of spiritual refreshment for you if you but drink from it. Synagogues in the ancient world were not just a home to touch the divine, but they actually served as a bridge between the heavenly realms and the earthly realms, as once our temple did so long ago in Jerusalem. And it does so today. The synagogue is the bridge between the realm of mystery and of hope and faith and the earthly realm of the mundane, ordinary, and sometimes hopelessness. And tonight on Kol Nidre, the gates of heaven are open, most open to our prayers, to the outpourings of our heart. The synagogue is the portal between those realms. Now, the truth is that the ancient synagogue was also a practical place for Jews. After all, we're Jews, and we're very practical people. The synagogue, believe it or not, was a job networking site. And in the ancient world, even though you might think of the simple shtetl of Eastern Europe, in the very ancient world, they could be as grand as some are today. 
The Talmud records the following about the ancient synagogue in Alexandria, Egypt, that coexisted with the Second Temple in Jerusalem and was eventually destroyed by Trajan during the Roman period following the destruction of our temple. This is the words from the Talmud. Listen to the description. Whoever has not seen the double colonnade of Alexandria and Egypt has not seen the glory of Israel. It was like a huge basilica that contained twice the number of men who went out from Egypt. And there were 71 golden armchairs for 71 sages, and each chair was no less than 21 talents of gold. And a wooden pulpit was in the middle of the palace, where the usher of the congregation stood with a scarf in his hand. And when the time came in the prayer for the people to respond, Amen, he raised the flag so that those who couldn't hear because of the great crowd could actually know when to respond. And the whole people would answer, Amen. And they did not sit mixed. Rather, the goldsmiths, the silversmiths, the blacksmiths, the coppersmiths, and the weavers all sat separately. And when a poor man went in, he recognized his fellow tradesmen and went to them and received work to support himself and his family. The Grand Synagogue of Alexandria, Egypt, was so big you couldn't even see the bima. You couldn't even hear the prayers. It had seatings by profession, so if you needed work, you could hang out with those in your trade. The Grand Synagogue of Alexandria was a home for vocational services and what we do today, the networking breakfast. The heart of the Jewish people, wherever we have lived, has been the synagogue. You see, we Jews are supposed to take care of our own, and we've always done that through the synagogue. Now, the synagogue in medieval times was also a hostel and an inn for the traveling Jew who sought refuge and safe haven while traveling in a world that was often hostile to the Jew. A traveling Jew could come to the synagogue, perhaps a merchant. They could come to a village and know that they would be fed, provided a place to lie down safely for the night. You see, this is how the custom of lighting Shabbat and holiday candles came into being that they would be lit in the synagogue. It became part of our Shabbat evening service, if you will, so that those Jews who were sleeping in the synagogue, who were travelers on their weary way, would also be able to make Shabbat. You see, the synagogue is a home for the Jew no matter where we travel. I bet some of you on your vacations and travel have specifically gone to see the synagogues of Europe, have stopped in when you've been away on a holiday to tour perhaps the Jewish museum and the synagogue there. It was the same then. Whether religious or not, it is the synagogue and the people within it that make up our Jewish community who have sustained the Jewish people throughout centuries of turmoil and troubles. It is the synagogue in grand and thriving times, like that of Alexandria, Egypt, or 20th century America, that has kept the Jewish people connected to one another through prayer, education, social needs, and life cycle moments. You see, home is where the heart is, and that home, that Jewish home, has been the synagogue the home and the heart of the Jewish people. Though recently in the last 10 years, there have been a lot who have questioned the synagogue's viability and its necessity. In this area, era of DYI, do-it-yourself Judaism, and rent a rabbi, you can get what you want without any commitment. Every person, every Jew for herself. No need to have a place for educating the Jew. I'll just look it up with Rabbi Google. No need for a place for Jews to meet. We have J-Date. 
No need to educate yourself about Judaism because I had a bar or bat mitzvah when I was 13 year old. And of course, that'll, that what I learned then will carry me through my 90s. Is the Jewish home of the synagogue passé? And so tonight I ask you, why do we need a synagogue in the 21st century? These questions haunt the Jewish people on this Kol Nidra night. They haunt us at a time when we Jews know that this is a night most open to our repentance and that the universe's harmonics vibrate in the lives of Jews. And these questions particularly haunt our own congregation as we have struggled to find the right balance between what we say we want and what we really commit to doing. It's no secret that these last few years we here at Colomy have struggled to find the right balance, not just financially, but the right balance of programs and outreach in this 21st century. Times have changed since we came together 25 years ago this year at the height of the AIDS crisis. And yet with this very high holy days, we at Colomy enter our 25th year. Times have changed for the better in many ways for all of us. We've won great battles and been part of great victories for LGBT civil rights and particularly the role that this congregation has played within the Jewish community on LGBT rights and inclusions is astounding. Each one of you, by your ongoing commitment to Kolomi, has made change and healing possible for LGBT Jews and their families, not just in our own synagogue, but in many synagogues. In particular, your support of Kol, in your support of Kolomi, you have sub supported my ability to be your champions, to bring our issues of equality for women, for LGBT people, for those whose children are differently abled, for Jews of color, and for anyone else who has fe felt otherwise marginalized, I have been through your direct support of Kolomi, I have been your voice. I have been able to sit in circles of the Jewish community where women and LGBT people have never sat before. As many of you know, I am currently the president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the international organization of reform, the Reform Rabbinate. More than 2,300 rabbis worldwide. The CCAR is the largest and oldest rabbinical organization in North America. My friends, this is no small thing. For the last year and a half and for six months more, I have had the privilege and honor to lift up the voice of Reform Judaism in circles very far from Kolomi and our synagogue home. But my vi voice, our Kolomi voice, is present in extremely powerful settings of the Jewish world, at the table of presidents of, major, of the major conference of American Jew Jewish organizations, at the table of Neely, which is an interfaith organization working for world peace with other heads of faith communities. I've had the meet meetings with the Prime Minister of Israel and high-level Israeli and American cabinet members meeting about the Iran deal, meeting with numerous Knesset members to push for equality for all Jews in Israel, for civil marriage in Israel, for an Israel grounded in democracy and to fight against a theocracy there. None of this would have been possible without this synagogue, without Kol Ami. Make no mistake, when the brand new Consul General of Israel for the Southern California region came to Los Angeles a month ago, 
What rabbi and what synagogue did he visit first? Oh, Wilshire Boulevard Temple. They're the oldest and the biggest. Temple Israel? Sinai Temple, Rabbi Wolpe. Beth Jacob, the largest Orthodox congregation in town? No, he visited with me and with Carrie Davidson as a representative of our board of trustees. Why? Why our little cola me? Because it is widely known in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in the cabinet in Israel of the value of this congregation and of our role, and yes, my role, in leading progressive Zionists in the reform movement, of our ongoing sport, support of Kolomi, of the LGBT community in Israel. Just two Shabbatot ago, the new co-chairs of the Aguda, Israel's national LGBT organization, came to visit us on Shabbat because of the more than two decades of support that this congregation has given to the Aguda. You see, that's only possible because of this synagogue that you built and that you sustain. Kolomi continues to make a difference, not just here in our Los Angeles, but our congregation's impact is felt worldwide. Well, those seem like very grand gestures. What about the meaning of the synagogue on the micro level? In this community, we have strengthened friendships and we have built families. In this community together, over the last 25 years, we have buried our dead and we've celebrated our marriages. We've ached at our divorces We've rejoiced in our children who are growing, and yes, in our grandchildren. This has been a spiritual home for the spiritual journey that this group has been taken, taken together for 25 years. We've laughed together at Purim spiels, danced together as we celebrated our triumphs and honored our volunteers at our galas, we have learned a little Torah together. We even wrote a Torah together, you'll remember. It's a lot in 25 years. We built our Jewish home here at Kol Ami. And we made friendships and relationships here. Even if you don't come to shul that often, Many friendship circles have been made in this place that continue to thrive until this very day. Yes, the heart beats strong at Kolami. The heart of the Jewish people beats strong in each of you. And so now in the 21st century, the question remains, is this enough? The synagogue is still a home for the Jewish heart, for Jewish longing, for Jewish hopes and dreams. But is our synagogue enough? Listen, we're all getting a little bit older now. Many of us are grayer than when we started this congregation 25 years ago. Some of us, me included, walk a little slower, and the aches and pains of life sometimes make it harder to navigate. And so I ask you on this Kol Nidra Eve, will you have the spiritual strength to navigate your elderhood? And could this synagogue be the kind of community that helps you navigate you see, I believe Kol Ami is strong. I believe it still is. But you have to see yourself here. You have to see your heart here. It's not enough to have a building on La Brea that is empty, where a small groups meet to learn or to celebrate, 
For that, my friend, is nothing but a museum. And you will have answered the question, is the synagogue necessary in the 21st century? Is our synagogue necessary in the 21st century? With a resounding no. The Jewish heart will beat strong if we turn to our congregations and to one another. And so tonight, I need you who are sitting on the sides to step forward, to be involved, to learn, to want to grow your spiritual life. I need those of you who are struggling for meaning to come together to explore it in our Kolami Jewish home. But if we are only a building on La Brea at Lexington, without people within, we will have answered that question of viability. And so I want to let you all in on a little secret. We've been searching around for the right balance for these last several years. You see, we've been focusing on the money. But that's not the place to focus on. The question, the question of balance is something different. The question isn't about money. Money is the symptom. It is a question of engagement, of seeing, of feeling your heart, a part of the Jewish heart that beats strongly today. The question of the synagogue's viability in the 21st century is about a sense of Jewish peoplehood, about a sense that you matter to the Jewish people. And that what you have to offer, your talents, your gifts, your search for meaning, is one that can be shared with others who are on their journeys as well. Will you be part of the great tide of Jewish history? Or will you sit on the sidelines content to let the streaming, binge-watching pablum of our time substitute for meaning, connection, and seeking out the spiritual in all of life? I choose to believe we are Kolami strong. I have shared the story with you before, but it is so important I'm going to share it with you again tonight. Perhaps you missed it the first time. There's a story about a nobleman who lived long ago in a European mountain village and who did something interesting when the townspeople came to see the beautiful synagogue that he had just built. They noticed that the nobleman had neglected to install any lamps. The nobleman gave to each family a lamp and he said to them, bring your lamp with you when you come to the synagogue and place it in your bracket on the wall. And know that when you're not here, the, that part of the synagogue will remain unlit and darkened. This is to remind you that when you fail to come, when you fail to be here, some part of God's house will be dark. Indeed, Kolami will go dark without you. So tonight, I want you to tell me what you are going to commit to doing. I'm not talking about money. I'll let the board deal with that. I'll let David deal with that in a few minutes. But I'm asking you to commit tonight to doing at least two projects with Kola Me this year. I commit to coming monthly to Shabbat services and then do it. I commit to volunteering to be part, one of part of our pillars and creating opportunities for others to engage. 
I commit to helping with our Guatemala mission in January. And if you can't go and volunteer, I will help with the backpack and school supply drive. I will commit to being part of our home visitor program, our mitzvah corps. I will commit to coming to our HIV group, which meets on Saturday, this Saturday at 1215, if I am a person living with AIDS. I will commit to come to Torah study or downtown lunch and learn once a month to grow my Jewish soul. I will commit to traveling to Eastern Europe on our congregational trip in June, making connections with worldwide Judaism. I will commit to coming to all of our Holy Day celebrations from the barbecue dinner in the sukkah this coming Sunday night at Sukkah Palooza to our Passover Seder in the spring. I will commit to helping grow our online learning experiment by signing up for it and participating. I will commit to keeping Kolomi strong for not only this 25th year, but for the next 25 years and beyond. Pick two. Just two. Please. In a couple of moments when David Kaminsky asks you to make a High Holy Day pledge, don't just make a monetary gift. Make a gift, a commitment of engagement. Think about what you will do in whatever way you can. Services? HIV group, if that applies? Did you know we have a book club? Woka, women of Kolomi. Mocha, men of Kolomi. I'll come to a holiday celebration, like Hanukkah. I'll go to on our social justice mission to Guatemala. Or come to Poland and Budapest with me this coming June. Take your place in the home, our synagogue home, and let us together fill our home with light and with heart and the many beating hearts of our members. And together, my friends, we will heal our wounds and salve our souls from the toxic, toxic world around us. And we will grow older in peace and harmony because we have each other and we will go deeper in our communion with each other and with God. The gates are open in heaven and here on earth at Kolomi. May you enter in both and receive the blessings that you seek. Ken Yehi Ratzon.